Okay, so we're now recording. Um, we are happy to have Professor Ed Ray Goings from Pomona College, who is going to speak to us about an introduction to descending fonts. All right, well, thank you very much, Kayla, for that great introduction. Um, I do apologize, actually, Kayla and I were both on a joint meeting that actually ran a little bit long, so yeah, but it's, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. So if you see some old friends that are here in the window and some um, people that I hope will be new friends sometime soon. Um, a lot of what I'm gonna say here is actually supposed to be very introductory. So I am gonna say some things that'll be here for the experts, but I'll try my best to really motivate this to explain why anyone would care about any of this here. Um, let me start by saying that a lot of this is based on research that I've done with undergraduates. And in particular, there is an RU that I run at Pomona College. It's called PRIME, um, Pomona Research and Mathematics Experience. So a lot of the pictures that you're gonna see here today, PRIME 2019 helped to come up with. And this last summer, I worked with the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute, MSRI, where as part of their undergraduate program, we also continued a lot of these same ideas. So I just wanna thank the students virtually who did a lot of work the last couple of years to help come up with some of these concepts. So let me maybe start with a very simple motivating question. Say that you have three houses and you want to connect those to three utilities. And for the sake of argument, let's say that those utilities are gas, water, and electricity. Now, what we'd like to do is connect all of these through some type of a line and literally, you can actually think of this as a line that we're gonna connect from the three houses at the top to the three utilities at the bottom. Now, of course, we like to make sure that these utility lines don't intersect. You know, you might agree that it won't be good if say the water line intersects with the electricity line. So we're just gonna ask the question, is there a way in which we can draw these um, nine lines so that they don't overlap? Right, the only place that they do overlap is at the vertices. So if you do know the answer, please don't shout it out. But again, this is just supposed to motivate a lot of these ideas here. Now, of course, using this, we can then try best to make some definitions in terms of graph theory. I'm not gonna worry about most of the definitions here. I'll just simply say, in a lot of what I'm going to say, we will have a finite graph and I'll care about the number of vertices, the number of edges, the number of faces. And I'm gonna focus on the concept of a bipartite graph which really means you can take the set of vertices and partition them into two disjoint sets that I'll call the black vertices and the white vertices so that no two edges in the set of black vertices are adjacent to each other and no two vertices in the white edges are, sorry, the white vertices are adjacent to each other. Right. Now with this, there's a few different examples of graphs you can consider. So let me consider examples of what are called complete graphs. Here, I'm taking, let's say, n vertices. So here, n is either three, four, or five. And I'm going to attach an edge between any two vertices. So like when n is equal to four, you can see here that I actually have six edges. So I should say four edges. So here, I'm just taking each of the four vertices and I'm attaching them to each of the other three vertices. At the bottom, you can see I've tried to count the number of vertices, edges, and faces. But the one that might be confusing is the one on the very right, right? The so-called uh, pentatope graph. In this case, you can see that the edges do overlap. So it's not quite clear what I mean by the number of faces. I'm gonna come back and say a little bit more about this one later, but hopefully it makes sense here how I've counted the number of vertices, the number of edges and the number of faces. Another type of graph that I'll be interested in is the complete bipartite graph. So here, when I say bipartite, I've tried to move around the vertices in such a way, you can more or less try to see what is the way that I've broken them to say maybe black vertices, white vertices. Well, the one in the middle, this I will call K23. So here what we've done is we've taken three vertices, maybe the ones along the equator in the middle, and I'm attaching those to each of the two vertices at the top and bottom. So like the North Pole and the South Pole. So that's what I mean by KMN, that somehow I have a bar partite graph where there are M black vertices and there are N white vertices, but it's complete meaning that each one of the black vertices 
is connected to each one of the white vertices. Just like before, you can try to count the number of vertices, edges, and faces. And the one that's not so clear is the K33 on the right. You know, there, that's exactly the utilities graph that we talked about a little bit earlier. But again, it's not really clear how many faces we actually have here. Well, the main theorems in all of this really started with Euler back in 1750. A finite connected graph is planar if and only if you have this nowadays so-called Euler characteristic. The number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is equal to two. Well, of course, we can generalize all of this. So instead of having to deal with maybe this alternating sum being two, it could be that this alternating sum is some other number. So I'll say that in general, you can look at either the complete graph Kn or the complete bipartite graph Kmn and try your best to count the number of vertices, the number of edges, the number of faces, but you find that in general, you don't get V minus E plus F equals two. You kind of have like this fudge factor that I'll call here the genus. And it was a theorem back in the 1960s that Ringel, Beinecke, and Herrera came up with this really nice formula that more or less says that you can't always write these as planar graphs, but you still have these numbers here, V, E, F, and G. Now, as you can probably guess, by plugging in M equals M and N equals three, or even maybe N is equal to five, then in those cases, G is equal to one. So you don't have V minus E plus F equals two. You actually have V minus E plus F equals zero. And actually, this is part of the larger theorem by Kuratowski and Wagner that says that a finite graph is planar if and only if it doesn't contain either K5 or K33 as its minor, which actually means, going back to our utilities problem, there is no way we can draw these edges between the houses and utilities such that they don't cross, right? That's the same thing as saying the K33 is not a planar graph. So again, I wanna to try to use this to motivate some things we're gonna say later, but this kind of gives us an answer here to this motivating question. So we can really ask the question, do we really have to restrict to the plane? You know, so far I've just talked about planar graphs, but are there other types of graphs we can write down? Well, of course, some of these types of graphs we nowadays know as Riemann surfaces. And I'm not gonna worry about giving a formal definition because I just wanna make things a little bit light today. You have the sphere that's up here in the upper left. You have the torus that's here on the upper right. And you have the so-called three hole torus that's here at the bottom. So we have various surfaces in which we can try our best to draw some graphs. So let me try to give a couple of examples here to motivate what I mean by all of this. I can talk about the complex plane. So think of this as like a sheet of paper that I'm going to allow to extend out infinitely far. I claim that this is the same as the unit sphere. Well, of course, there's a couple of different ways you can say this. One is you can try to write this out algebraically, and these are the formulas that I have from the middle that says, if you're given a point Z in the plane, you can always write that as a point UVW sitting on the sphere. But I can also do all of this geometrically via what's called stereographic projection. So the orange, or just the yellow sphere you see here in the middle, that'll be my S2 of R. And then the blue, that's really my plane, P1 of C. And you can see here that if I try to draw a line, I can either start with the black dot and the blue plane, that will be my complex number Z. And I can draw a line through the North Pole, the point 001, that'll intersect at this red dot, which is UBW. So that's how I can start with the complex point and end up with the point on the sphere. Conversely, if I have a red point on the sphere, my UBW, I can draw this line through the North Pole. And then I have something here in this blue plane, that will be my complex number Z. So this is what I mean by saying that they're the same. Geometrically, I can go back and forth between the two. So because of this, I can actually draw graphs around the surface of a sphere. So you can see here on the left, we have our complete bipartite graph, K23. And if I just kind of wrap things around on the sphere, essentially using stereographic projection, you can see here that I have now a graph on the surface of a sphere. So I really am gonna think of my graphs in this way. I don't really wanna think of them as kind of sitting in this plane. It's like this infinitely large sheet of paper. 
I really want to wrap them around the surfaces of things, in this case, on a sphere. Of course, there are other examples we can write down. So we can talk about the so-called torus. And there's a couple of different ways you can do this. So one is you can write the torus quite literally as something drawn in three dimensions. So this is what I mean in terms of these points, U, V, W, or perhaps many of you are used to seeing the, the torus as something like the unit interval zero one cross the unit interval zero one. Well, you can think of those as maybe like we have here two angles like a theta and phi, and as you perhaps wrap, wrap around one angle in one way and then wrap around the other angle in the other way, you can now see the blue object that I have here at the bottom, right? So this is literally why you can think of the torus as kind of being graded by these angles. So I have an angle moving around in one direction and then another angle moving around in a different direction. Now, the important thing is, Using this Riemann surface, we can draw more graphs. So here's a picture of K5, right? The complete graph on five vertices. On the left, this is our poor attempt at a planar embedding. But of course, it's not an embedding because the edges actually overlap with each other. On the right, however, you can now see that I've tried to draw K5 on the surface of a torus. Now, if you want to think of maybe like the torus is like a bagel, you can kind of think of these orange lines as me cutting along the surface of the bagel. And then I can ask how many different separate sections have I cut my bagel into? And of course, the number of separate sections will be five. That's the number of faces. So here the point is the one on the left, I can't determine how many faces, but the one on the right, I can because that really is an embedding of K5 on the torus. So in this case, I would say that the K5 is a toroidal graph, not only because it's genus is one, but also because I can embed it on the surface of the torus without the edges crossing. We can do something similar here with K33, our nice utility graph. So again, K33 on the left, that is our poor attempt at an embedding. Of course, it doesn't work because we've already proved that the edges have to intersect. So instead, over here on the right, we do have a bona fide embedding of K33 on the surface of the torus. The way I've drawn things here are you'll see there are three purple vertices inside the middle of the torus, and then three brown vertices on the outside of the torus. That's what I mean by kind of breaking it up into these um, two different colors. So here, you can do the same trick as before. Think of the surface of the torus as a bagel take the orange lines and try to use that as a way to cut along the surface. And you'll see that you're gonna break this up into three different pieces. That's what it means by saying you have three separate faces. Um, let me just say that it took me forever to figure out how to put all of these in Mathematica. So I am extremely proud of these graphs. Um, they were not easy to do at all. They, they were a major headache, but, but at least I'm pretty proud of how they came out. So of course, these are just a couple of examples, K3, K33, K5. We can talk about a much more general question. So let's say that someone were to give you any KN, and now ask you, can you draw this on the surface of some Riemann surface? Well, according to that theorem of Beinecke and Herrera, you know what the genus is, and that allows you to figure out where you can embed these graphs. So for example, using the formulas, you can see that there are certain graphs that you can draw on the sphere. So for example, if you're just doing Kn, the only ones you can do will be K1, K2, K3, and K4. Those are the only, plain, the only complete graphs that have a planar embedding. Similarly, if you looked at K1n and K2n, those are the only complete bipartite graphs that can be drawn on the sphere without crossings. If you go to genus one, these are the the toroidal graphs, the only ones you can do will be K5, K6, and K7, if you're allowed to look at the complete graphs. And for the complete bipartite, again, it's just a finite list, K33, K34, K35, K36, and K44. So the main question here is, is there an easy way to draw these? Now, I can tell you when I first started really thinking about this years and years ago, I realized that graph theorists typically like to look at graphs in the plane. As soon as you start to talk about graphs on things like a torus, 
their head starts to explode and then it's impossible to have the conversation after that. So then you can ask the question, okay, fine, for the ones who can do these and are at least willing to have the conversation, how do you do it? Um, I can tell you that one of the names I mentioned, um, Lowell Beinecke, we actually had a really fun conversation once where he actually went to the chalkboard, started to draw up some of these to explain to me how all of these work. I even had an undergraduate once where I said, you know, case three, six, K four, four, I have no idea how to do this. So of course she impressed me. She just went to my chalkboard and just said, see, it's easy. Just draw the lines and it then completely worked out. So if any of you can do this, I am highly impressed. I have a really hard time figuring out how to draw any of these, but I can tell you the theorem says all of these here I have on the screen, at least for genus one, can be done. But I am not superhuman. I have a very simple question. How do I draw these? So I'm saying all of this to say this is part of my motivation for looking at this, trying to find easy ways of coming up with ways to draw these graphs. So this is more or less for the experts. Um, I'm only gonna skim through this because this isn't really crucial for um, the pictures that I wanna show. I am gonna introduce the concept of a belly map. And simply put, let's start with a Riemann surface X. You can think of this as like the sphere of the torus or any of these other things. Roughly speaking, I'll say that a critical point is when the derivative vanishes and a critical value is the value of a critical point. So this is like if I tried to plot this in a ZW axis, Z where the derivative vanishes would be my critical point. W, right, the value where, it's just the image of that Z is a critical value. So there are these three theorems that came about roughly between 1956 and 1980 that go as follows. Say that you have a compact connected Riemann surface, like a sphere or a torus. First of all, you can really think of this as a curve that is, it basically looks like the zero set of some polynomial with some coefficients a, i, j, and the variables x and y. Second, if x can be defined by polynomial equation where not all of the coefficients are transcendental, then there exists a rational function that has at most three critical values. Conversely, if there exists a rational function that has at most three critical values, then such a polynomial equation has coefficients that are not transcendental. So the middle one, or should first start with the, the third statement, is a very deep statement by Andre Bay that gets into Galois descent. That was proved in 1956, very hard theorem. The converse was proved about 25 years later by Gennady Belli that actually is a really simple proof. It's maybe two pages. But the point is that now we have an if and only if. So simply put, such a function here exists if and only if x can be defined over q bar. That's kind of the statement here for, for the experts. This function, which we essentially normalize so that the three critical values are zero, one, infinity, is what we call a belly map. Now, given a belly map, you can construct a graph that we call a descend on Right, it's just a fancy French phrase for child's drawing. Now, I do want to show a lot of pictures, but again, just for the experts, um, Alexander Grothendieck came up with this concept after he was made aware of Bailey's converse theorem to Bayes result. And so he really thought of these children's drawings as just a souped up triangulation of a Riemann surface. So the point is that you can actually say a lot about the Riemann surface and its topology if you know the belly map. So for example, given the belly map, you can write down the genus of the surface, right? That's what I tried to say here at the bottom. But again, we're not really gonna focus on this. This is just for the experts that maybe know a little bit more about Riemann surfaces. So I wanna focus on graphs, right? I just maybe just wanna show you a few of these since this is for a geometry lab here. So first of all, you can write down lots and lots of examples of belly maps. They are rational functions, ratios of polynomials. You just have to make sure that you know what happens when um, the derivative is equal to zero, right? That's going to give you the critical points. But the more important thing is when I evaluate at those critical points, I get back either zero, one, or infinity. Now, let me just try to show a few pictures here to explain what all of this means. So let me start with z to the n, right? Pick n to be any positive integer that you want. And here now I can first ask, what are the critical points? 
you basically take the derivative, set it equal to zero. Z is equal to zero is the only critical point, which means that beta of Z equals zero is the only critical value. That critical point corresponds to the black dot you see on the left in the middle, Z is equal to zero. And the number of edges coming out is the exponent. So for the graph you see here, the exponent is five. Right. But notice that even though you have the graph on the left, you can still use stereographic projection and find the graph on the right. So again, I really am kind of doing both of these together. Whatever I draw on the left is going to be the same as what I draw on the right. I should also point out that the black dot corresponds to the inverse image of zero. The red dots correspond to the inverse image of one. And the blue lines correspond to the inverse image of line segment from zero to one, All right? So I'll try to say a little bit more about that on the next few graphs here. So here's another example, right? So my beta of Z at the bottom, that is an example of a Bellu map. So again, I can take the derivative, set it equal to zero. When I set this beta equals to zero, the black dots correspond to the nth roots of minus one. It turns out that the red dots, when I set beta is equal to one, the red dots correspond to the nth roots of plus one. And then the blue lines correspond to the inverse image of the line segment from zero to one. Right. There's also some symmetry happening here. So you can see if I essentially take the map, z goes to an nth root of unity times z, that will correspond to a cyclic rotation. I can also do z goes to one over z, and with the sphere, that corresponds to just flipping the sphere upside down. So there actually is a lot of symmetry that's built in to what's happening here. So here's the third one. Hopefully this here looks a little bit familiar. This is the dodecahedron. So here I have my belly map. And again, if I set it equal to zero, those are the black dots. Set it equal to one, those are the red dots. Look at the inverse image of the line segment from zero to one, those are gonna be the blue edges. And I can really wrap everything onto the sphere via stereographic projection and that's the picture you see on the right. So hopefully you see a pattern here. The platonic solids are all examples of descend dome maps, right? This is like one of the fundamental ideas. I can draw all of these really nice symmetric graphs on the surface of the sphere. Right. Now here's one of my favorite ones. Um, with the RU that I had back in 2019, we spent a lot of time discussing can we really come up with pretty graphs? Can we maybe explain this to just any random person on the street? So here we decided to create a movie to actually show the rotations. This is literally a descend on foam. It is the soccer ball. It's technically the truncated icosahedron. And once you just put this on the surface of the sphere, you can just see here exactly how this looks. So yes, the soccer ball is another example of a descend on foam. Um, this is another picture I'm actually really happy about Myself and the students spent a lot of time writing code to come up with graphics like this. And this took many, many weeks to come up with, but we're still very happy that we, we eventually got this to work. So I think my time probably is, is about up. So I'm just only gonna show a few more pictures here. I'm not really gonna worry about trying to go over the details. You don't just have to do graphs on the sphere. You can actually do graphs on other fancy objects. So if you happen to know about elliptic curves, you can actually write down what's called an elliptic integral. This allows you to take a look at the graphs on the torus. It's not easy to come up with examples of belly maps for elliptic curves, but some of them do exist. These here actually appear on No Melky's webpage. But here I just wanna show you a few pictures. Um, these pictures are not as great, but this is actually one of the projects that I had my students in 2020 this last student to work, this last summer to work on. So these are all examples of descend on fonts. Now we've wrapped these around on the torus. And really the complication here is that we really had to use elliptic logarithms to work. So this is very, very subtle. I do apologize, the graphs are not great. But again, my students from last summer, they basically have done it. We're just kind of putting all the final touches together. I do want to point out this last one here. This is actually K33 as a bipartite graph, remember that descend on phones are examples of bipartite graphs that's drawn on the torus. 
This graph is not great because again, my students are still working on, on a slightly better code to get the picture to come out. But the whole point here is, yes, if you want any easier way to draw K33 on the surface of the torus, here it is. Here's your belly map, here's your elliptic curve. I was really happy when we came up with this because remember how I started things. I don't know how to draw these pictures. So when I see belly map and elliptic curve, I'm happy because then I know how to plot these things. So maybe just some statements about future work if any of you are interested. Um, there is a wonderful website called LMFDB that stands for L-Series Modular Forms Database. This actually now has information about belly maps. Um, John Boyd and his grad students have done a wonderful job the last couple of years putting a lot of information in here. So if you do want to know more examples, I highly recommend that you go to LMFDB. I know it's technically still in beta stage now, but still they've done a great job in putting the information there. And if any of you are curious as to exactly what my students did in 2019, again, they wanted to try to explain all of this to just the person off the street. So I forced them, yes, I do mean forced them, to come up with the movie to actually introduce the concept of monodromy, which you don't have time to go over, but certainly I do highly recommend that you take a look at the video here. So with that, thank you very much for your, your time. Um, the QR code here actually is a link to the movie if any of you are curious to, to see it. So thanks. All right, let's thank the speaker. Thank you, Ed Ray. Um, any questions for, for Ed Ray? Hopefully many. I don't have a so, question. Oh, Ed Ray, I, I think. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, well, I, I was just going to say that the, this is the by far the best talk I've ever heard on the Saint Enfant. This is this is amazing. Just very, very clear and uh, an awesome pictures. I'm just just floored by it. Uh, but no, this this is great. Not a question, just just general praise. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very kind. Thank you. Um, Hey, Andre, it's great to, great to hear you give, as usual, a spectacular talk. Uh, I'm wondering if there are some of us in this audience who love square tiled surfaces, and I know we've talked about the connections. I wonder if you would want to say a word or two about any connections to square tiled surfaces. Um, oh, what, 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 do, what do I want to say? Um, or, or not. That's also fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, you know, like it's, it's one of these things where I, I've just spent so much time thinking about it, trying to figure out how do I answer it within like 30 seconds or so. Um, so let, let me say in, in general, I, I am very interested in this concept of branch covers of curves. So belly maps are one example. The other one that I really love, and I think this is what Jade was getting into, what are called origami. So origami is not the paper folding thing that you, you might think. It's actually a slightly different construction where you can talk about um, a torus where you can think of this as like one sheet of paper where now you've glued together two edges to form a cylinder and you glue together the two circles of those edges to form now this torus. You can do this in a more general way. So there is a way that if you give me, let's say a group, more specifically a group generated by two elements, so this might be like the dihedral group or one of these. Then you can take the, a, sheet, a sheet of, stack of sheets of paper where the number of sheets is the size of the group. For every element of the group, you label that as, you put that element as the label of your sheet of paper, and then you form a gluing rule that goes something like this. Um, if you're given, let's say, a sheet label H and a sheet label G, then I would roughly speaking, say I'm going to attach G and H on the left if they're multiplied together, if they come about by multiplication by one generator, so H equals G times A, and I'll glue, let's say, H to the top of G if H equals G times B. Remember that I have a group here that's generated by two elements, A and B. So you can actually now take a surface and form it by gluing together sheets of paper. So this is actually a project that my students this past summer worked on. This is a lot more difficult than it first sounds. Even if you take a really simple group, like say S3, so group of order six, you then have to ask the questions, not only what is the surface you glued together, 
So what's the genus and how do you realize it? Mm -hmm. Example you give here is like genus three. When I tried to have my students this last summer think of what a genus three surface looks like, that was a little bit difficult, but they surprised me in that they started to sew sheets of paper together. They started to knit things together. Like they were doing all of these really creative ways to figure out how do you actually see the square tile surface. So, so I'm kind of convinced that there are really fun things you can do with a lot of these projects. You just have to think very creatively. But, but yeah, I love square tile surfaces now. Like this is definitely the thing that, that I want to do, but they are not the easiest things to, to deal with. If anyone has any suggestions on how to visualize them, I would love to see. Them. This is kind of my thing as you could probably see with the pictures. I'm really about visualization and trying your best to kind of show everyone else, you know, these weird mathematical concepts, but with pretty pictures. So maybe I have a suggestion in that direction, which is it's easy when you if you put things in motion. Um, so not easy, but one way to think about them is to, to, to draw a game of, say, Pac-Man or draw a trajectory running around. Of course, visualizing them embedded in three dimensional space is very hard because you can't smoothly embed them there. But if you if you think about them as a weird as a weird Pac-Man board, it's it, you can draw a little you can draw little things running around. So that's a way of at least showing what these things are, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wh while you're saying that, I'm gonna maybe just show a, a quick video. Um, I'm not gonna say much about it, but um, I 100% agree with you that that is something I, I am very very interested in and I just want to pull up and I will show you this video while we're chatting here in case anyone has any other comments after the video we'll still have a chance to talk um, and ask questions of Ed Ray and Gathertown that's right Anton uh and That's right. I uh, put links in the chat. So uh, we'll be putting this talk uh, on the seminar page at geometrylabs.net slash seminar. And we do have a link for Gather Town there. And uh, I also put uh, our seminar up on research seminars so you can subscribe uh, so you can get notified for future talks. Uh, Laura, did you want to say something? Uh, I was, Ed Ray, would you mind putting the links to the Belly Map One. website that you had and also the I didn't get the QR code when you showed it, but if you have a link to that, I'd love to take a look at those. Yeah, I, I'd be if happy you could to throw them in the chat or something. I'll be happy to do that. Thanks. Great talk. Thanks. I guess I also wanted to um, mention oh, uh, along Jayadev's idea of- One more quick request is- it... uh -huh. Sorry, what was that? Uh, could we could we just stay in Zoom for a minute after Ed, after Ed Ray is done showing the video? Because Dave Sinha has a couple of just a couple of things he'd like to say to uh, to this crowd. So could we just stay in Zoom for a second? And I'm wondering if it would be possible for you to give Dave screen sharing privileges for just a moment after we're done with the, the video. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, yeah, maybe I'll stop recording once uh, once the video is done. Yeah, I put the, the links in there, so I'm, I'm all done showing stuff. And I'm, I'm happy to either send videos or send links to videos if anyone is interested afterwards. OK. Well, let's thank Adria again.